So what we're going to start looking at now is we're going to start looking at a, a very special way of representing power series um, called the Taylor or a McLaren, McLaren series. Um, a McLaren series is actually a special case of a Taylor series. Um, and these end up becoming really, really important and very handy instead of a lot of different applications. And they're crucially important for doing later mathematics. Um, so let's actually take a look at, let, let's ask a question. Let's suppose that I have a function, okay? And it's represented by a power series. So let's say that I have this function and it's represented by this power series. All right, and say that we have um, x minus a is the radius of cur uh, uh, convergence, or r is the radius of convergence, and so we kind of define it, and we're going to say, let's just assume that it's going to converge. So for right now, we're going to assume it's going to converge. We'll talk about whether or not it'll converge later on, okay? And what we want to know is, what are these coefficients? So let's start out and let's uh, first ask ourselves, well, C naught is probably the easiest one to kind of think about, okay? So C naught is, um, right, if we plug in A, okay, if we plug in A here for F of X, we'll get F of A, and then that's gonna equal, we'll have C naught, but then it'll be plus, and then this term is gonna be zero, right? The, sec the first, second term is gonna be zero, Third term zero, zero. So all the other terms are gonna zero out. So it'll be zero plus zero plus zero all the way down. So that inevitably means that f of a is gonna be c naught. So that'll be our value for c naught. Seems to make a lot of sense too when you kind of think about like say for example if we're doing differential equations and how is it that we're gonna actually figure out this first constant? Well, what we do is we go in, we plug in um, whatever its value is, right? Okay, in this case the center and we get back C naught. It makes sense, right? Okay, cool. Now, let's say for example, next we wanna know what C1 is, okay? So C1, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, we got F prime of X now, and F prime of X now is gonna be, well, C naught's gonna go away because it's just constant, and then what we're left with is just C1 plus C2, and then, um, or 2C2, pardon me, 2c2 times x minus a plus 3c3 x minus a squared plus, and then we would have like a 4c4 x minus a cubed, and so on and so on and so forth. Now, what we'll do then is we're gonna plug in f prime of x, so at, uh, into, we're gonna plug a into f prime of x, so that's then gonna give me f prime of a is just gonna equal then C1, okay? So it'll end up equaling C1 because we're gonna get C1 plus zero, plus zero, plus zero, all the way on down. So that's what F prime of A is gonna be. C1 is gonna be F prime of A. Now let's talk about C2. So now I'm gonna take F double prime of X. I'm gonna actually take the derivative again. And when I take the derivative again, C1 is gonna go away. And um, we're gonna be left with 2c2 plus, and then this will be six, or let's actually rewrite this more appropriately as two times three, c3 times x minus a, plus um, three times four times c4 times x minus a squared, and then we'll go so on and so on and so forth, okay? Now, if we plug in a again, so f double prime of a, is then gonna equal two times C2, okay? Let's look at F, uh, F, uh, F to the third. So F to the third of X is then gonna equal, well, what's gonna happen is, is that our C2 term is gonna go away. We're gonna be left with two times three C3 plus, and this will be three, uh, two times three times four times x minus a, and you can actually kind of imagine that the next term here is gonna be 
3 times 4 times 5 times x minus a squared. Kind of seems that that's kind of the pattern that we're going with here. Plus, and then so on and so on and so forth. And so f triple prime of a is then going to equal 2 times 3 times c3 because again we're going to zero out all the terms after that first term. And so what we kind of see, and if you kind of look, imagine what's going to happen next, the next term is going to be 2 times 3 times 4 times, excuse me, c, there should be a c4 right there, and there should be c5. Um, 2 times 3 times c4, times 4 times c4, and a 3 times 4 times 5 times c5, okay, and so on and so on and so forth. So each term inside of the series is going to end up being given by this kind of uh, this equation. That is, is that fn of a is going to equal, and this is going to be n factorial times c to the n. And so to answer our question as to which cn we're going to use, we're going to get cn is going to equal fn of a divided by n factorial, where fn of a is the nth root or excuse me, not the nth root, but the nth derivative of f, whatever our function f is, okay? And so this gives us a really easy way, or a fairly easy way, to actually write um, a function as a, a power series, right? Because we can actually just go in, take derivatives, take consecutive derivatives, and then that should give us a, a complete sense of what our, our function is as a Taylor series, okay? So let's actually now look at what the definition for a Taylor series is. So here's our definition for a Taylor series. If f has derivatives of all orders, x equals a, then the Taylor series for the function f at a is, and it's this, okay? It's the sum n equals zero up to infinity of fn of a divided by n factorial times x minus a to the n. And that'll equal f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a divided by two factorial, so on and so forth, which is what we've seen, okay? And so, now one thing to get key here is, is that it's entirely possible that, um, you know, uh, past a certain value of big N, right? When, when we say big N, like particular value of N, what we might end up getting is we might end up getting our derivatives going to zero. This is actually gonna be the case with all polynomials. Polynomials are all gonna have their derivatives going to zero. Whereas, like say for example, like a function like sine or cosine is actually going to have um, a Taylor series where the values or the, the values of the polynomial are just going to keep going on and on and on and on and on. Let's take a look at an example um, of a Maclaurin series. That is a Maclaurin series, right? Is this one is the Taylor series for f at zero. So it's a special case in which we set a equal to zero. Okay, and we're going to look at the Maclaurin series for sine. All right, very famous one, the Maclaurin series for sine. So we're going to let f of x equal sine x, okay? And so that means that f prime of x is going to equal um, cosine of x. f double prime of x will equal negative sine x. f triple prime of x will equal um, cosine x, or negative cosine x. And f quadruple prime of x is going to equal sine x again. And then we're just going to continue to do this. f to the fifth of x will equal now cosine of, cosine of x. And we just cycle back. We're going to cycle back. And f cubed, or f to the third, or uh, f to the sixth will then be negative sine x. f to the seventh will be negative cosine x, right? So on and so on and so forth, OK? Let's take a look at what this looks like now, OK? So I'm going to now plug that into my Taylor series. So I'm going to find out what f of 0 is. So f of 0 is sine of 0, and so that's equal to 0. Okay, so sine of 0 is 0. So my c1 is going to, or yeah, my c0, excuse me, is going to equal 0. To give us c1 now, that's going to equal f prime of 0 divided by 1 factorial. And so f prime of 0, that's cosine x, so that's going to end up being equal to um, 1 divided by 1 factorial. And so that just equals 1. So that's what C1 is. C2 will end up being equal to 1 over 2 factorial, and 2 factorial is just 2. 
times, and this one's gonna be now negative sine zero, so f prime of, f double prime of zero, which just ends up equaling zero again. C3, well, you can kind of see, all right, C3 is gonna end up being now negative one. So C3 is gonna equal now one over three factorial times, okay, uh, times negative one. So it equals negative one sixth. C4 will end up equaling, well, that's sine of zero. So we can kind of think that F to, to the fourth of zero is gonna be zero again. So it's gonna be zero. C5 then is gonna equal one over five factorial, okay? Which ends up giving us um, 120. So we got one over five factorial times one. Okay, so that's one over 120. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug that into my, my equation for the Taylor series to see what that uh, power series representation or the Taylor series representation is of sine x. So sine x then is gonna equal, all right, it'll be first, our first term is a zero plus one times x, because remember a is zero plus zero plus one over six times x minus, uh, x cubed plus zero plus one over 120 x to the fifth plus dot dot dot. What we can imagine though next is gonna be plus zero, right? Because the next term is gonna end up being a sine. So it's gonna be plus zero. Then we're actually going to, by the way, this should be a minus one sixth right, because it's a minus one sixth that's negative. The next term is gonna end up being a minus one over seven factorial x to the seventh, and so on and so on and so forth, okay? And so what you're gonna see is you got the alternating series, right? What we have here is an alternating series in which each term is odd, right? Each power is odd. And so every odd power is gonna have a coefficient and every even power is gonna to go to zero. And that's actually why it is the case that sine is an odd function, right? Or that's one of the reasons why we think of sine as an odd function. There's a geometric one, but this also shows us that sine's odd, okay? So our alternating series now, we can rewrite this. This is gonna end up being the sum, um, n equals, and let's think one to infinity, okay? And our first term is gonna be a one, so this is gonna be x, okay? to the 2n minus one, because we only want the odd powers, so there'll be x to the 2n minus one, and then it'll be divided by, and now what we'll have is we'll have, this is one factorial, this is three factorial, five factorial, so this is gonna be 2n minus one factorial. And then because it's an alternating series, since we have the alternation here, it'll end up being times, um, and this will be then uh, negative one, and notice the first term, okay, is gonna end up being positive, so we'll make this to the n minus one. All right, and there's your alternating series. If we wanna set n equal to zero, then what we'll do is we'll let this equal the sum n equals zero up to infinity, and this will then be x to the two n plus one now. Okay, so we'll add the two n plus one divided by two n plus one factorial, okay, and this will then be negative one to the n. And there we are. Let's take a look at cosine x now. So we got f of x is gonna equal cosine x, okay? And so what we'll do is we're gonna construct the Taylor series for cosine, or actually we'll construct the Maclaurin series for cosine. And so first we're gonna get f prime of x for cosine is gonna be negative sine x. f double prime of x is thus gonna equal negative cosine x. f triple prime of x is gonna equal um, sine x, okay? And f to the fourth of x is gonna equal cosine x. And then we're gonna cycle again once we hit f to the fifth of x is gonna then equal negative sine x again, and then we're just gonna keep going and going and going, okay? 
So now we'll take uh, f prime of x and we're going to have f prime of 0 because we're going to find the Maclaurin series. Okay, so f prime of 0 is going to equal now negative sine 0, so that's just going to be 0. Um, uh, f of, excuse me, I need, do need to do f of 0. f of 0 is going to equal 1, okay, because that's cosine of 0. f prime of 0 is going to equal 0. f double prime of 0 is going to equal then negative 1. f triple prime of 0 is equal to 0. f to the 4 of 0 is equal to 1. And f to the fifth of zero is going to equal um, zero, and then so on and so on and so forth. And what you're going to see is we've got this alternating series again. Okay, we've got an alternating series again that we can use um, for this cosine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rewrite this. So now what we're going to get is that cosine x, our function, is going to equal while well, the first coefficient is one right here, one plus, and this will be negative one times one over two factorial times x squared, okay, plus, and then notice we'll go to zero, then we'll go to positive one, and this will be one over now four factorial, right, because remember it's the fourth derivative, so one over four factorial um, x to the fourth, plus one over, or excuse me now minus, because we're gonna switch signs again, one minus one over six factorial x to the sixth, plus dot, 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 so on and so forth. Notice that we're gonna eliminate all of our odd terms, and so this is why cosine is in fact odd, right? And if you kind of think about this, now this is the other thing here. How we kind of use these, or maybe how we might think about these, is that if I wanted to say like cosine of zero, well cosine of zero is then gonna equal one minus one over two factorial times zero squared plus one over four factorial zero to the fourth, minus one over six factorial, zero to the sixth, and then so on and so on and so forth, and that means that you're gonna end up equaling one, right? And so consequently, this series, this infinite series, you can see like at zero, oh yeah, cosine of zero is one, right? If you went in and you put in, say for example, pi over four, you would get, if you went out sufficiently long, right, you would end up getting cosine, the, the value of cosine pi over four, which is square root of two over two. All right, and so this Taylor series, in fact, is the cosine of x. Now we'll talk in just a moment about how do it is that we know that our Taylor series will equal our, our function here, okay? So cosine x now can be written as equal to the sum, n equals, and let's go from zero to infinity, okay? So the first term is going to be x to the two n, right, because we have an x to the zero term, divided by, and this will be n factorial, or two n factorial, excuse me, two n factorial, and then we need the uh, uh, interchanging number, so this is gonna be one, uh, negative one to the n. And there we go, and you can see, right, even, right, it's cosine x, so it's gonna end up being even. All right, let's take a look at another problem here. Let's say, for example, I wanna find a Taylor series for f of x equals natural log of x around x equals one, and then I wanna find its radius of convergence. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this up and I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna find those derivatives um, of f of x. So, right, we've got f of x is gonna equal the natural log of x. We'll have f prime of x is then gonna equal one over x. f double prime of x is gonna equal negative one over x squared. F triple prime of x is gonna equal um, two over x cubed. F quadruple prime of x is gonna end up equaling six over x to the fourth, and so on and so on and so forth. And we'll see what those look like in just a bit. Now, it makes sense for us to not try and find um, what the, the uh, Taylor series is for f of x equals natural log of x around x equals zero, like the Clarence series, because natural log of uh, zero is not actually defined, all right? So we wouldn't actually be able to find that, but we can find it for one. So we'll first time we're gonna have f of one, okay, is gonna equal zero. f, uh, f prime of one will end up equaling one. f double prime of one will equal negative one over one, so negative one. F triple prime of one will equal um, two. 
and f quadruple prime of 1 is going to end up equaling 6. By the way, which is equal to 2 times 3. So now we're going to actually just put this in here. We're going to get equals 0 plus x minus 1 minus 1 half times x minus 1 squared plus 2. And then this is 3 factorial, so this is going to be 2 times 2 times 3 okay, times x minus 1 cubed minus 2 times 3 divided by 2 times 3 times 4 times x minus 1 to the fourth plus dot 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 dot. And if I rewrite this, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get x minus 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 squared plus 1 third x minus 1 cubed minus 1 fourth x minus 1 to the fourth. And then you can imagine the next one is going to be a plus, okay, 1 fifth x minus 1 to the fifth and then so on and so on and so forth. Which means that our series now is going to be the sum n equals 0 up to infinity of, and this will be then x minus 1 to the n divide, uh, divided by n plus 1 times negative 1 to the n, negative 1 to the n, excuse me. And that will end up being our, our, our Taylor series and our summation. So now that we have that, what we can do is we can go out and find its radius of convergence. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's find the radius of convergence. I'll use the ratio test in order to do that. So I'm going to take the sum, n equals 0, or I'm actually, excuse me, I'm going to take the absolute value of x minus n, or x minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 2 now, n plus 1 plus 1, okay, times negative 1 to the n plus 1 divided by x minus 1 to the n divided by n plus 1 times, in this case, negative 1 to the n. Now, the negative 1s can just cancel out because we're looking at the absolute value, and we are going to be taking the limit as n approaches infinity of this. Okay? So at the top, we're going to end up with x minus 1, okay? Or in absolute value, we'll look at x minus 1 divided by, and this is going to end up being, um, or times, n plus 1 divided by n plus 2. And then we'll take the limit as n approaches infinity of that. Okay. This is then going to equal x minus 1, right? And then we can take the limit as n approaches infinity of just this n plus 1 over n plus 2. And so consequently, we just have x minus 1 as our radius of convergence, okay? Or as the value for uh, from our ratio test. So now we know that we're going to get convergence when x minus 1, okay, is then less than 1. And so consequently, our radius of convergence r is equal to 1. And that uh, is, makes sense considering the fact that when we actually hit 1, we're going down towards infinity. So our examination of Taylor series is actually leads us to a, another way of thinking about functions and approximations of functions, and that's these things called Taylor polynomials. Now what a Taylor polynomial is, is it's an approximation of a function. And it's an approximation of a function given a certain number of terms inside of that Taylor polynomial. So we've got this definition here, and that is, is that if n has n derivatives at x equals a, then that nth Taylor polynomial for f at a is going to be this, pn of x equals f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a uh, over 2 factorial, so on and so forth, just utilizing those Taylor polynomial, uh, those Taylor series terms, all right? So like for example, if I were to use the, the p of 0, okay, 
So P of zero is going to end up just be uh, going to be just f of a. Okay. P of one would then equal f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And we can imagine that we're going to do that so on and so on and so forth, where we just increase the terms right by one each and every time. So let's let, let's take for example, let's find p of three for the natural log of x. Okay, for the natural log of x at x equals one. And so we saw that one here before, right? So we know that we have f of, um, we'll start out with f of one, which equals the natural log of one is gonna equal zero. Then we'll have f prime of one, which equals one over uh, one, right? Because one over x is gonna equal one. Then we'll have f double prime of one. f double prime of one is then gonna equal negative one over x squared, which equals negative one over one squared, which equals negative one. f triple prime of, uh, of one is gonna be two over uh, one cubed, which equals just two. And so we can stop right there because now we're at three. We're looking for polynomial P3, so we can stop at f prime of three. And then we're just gonna plug it into this formula. So P of three is gonna end up equaling, right, zero plus uh, one times x minus one plus negative one over two factorial times x minus one squared plus um, two over three factorial times x minus one cubed. And that is our third order Taylor polynomial. So when we look at, we're gonna look at a set of Taylor polynomials. We'll look at zero through three of these Taylor polynomials. And so these are the ones for ln of x. And so we'll see here, this is the ln of x term. So this is like our green one is gonna be ln of x. And then you can see um, that we've got the p zero of x is the, the horizontal line, uh, p zero of x equals zero. Then we'll have x minus one. We'll have um, x my, uh, the one for P2, right? And that one will end up being this red one right here. Uh, excuse me, not the red one, but the, yeah, the red one. Oh no, that the red one is the um, cubed. The squared term here is this black one, all right? And what you wanna notice is you wanna notice that around or in the vicinity of one, okay? In the area of A, in this case, our values are all fairly close to, um, the natural log of x, right? At one, they're in fact exactly equal to the natural log of x. So that's, you know, that's all good, right? They're gonna all have zero out at x, natural log of one is zero, all of these are gonna end up being, being zero at one at two. But what we wanna notice is that as we move further away from one, okay, what we end up with is we end up going further and further and further away from the natural log of x, all right? And, and that's kind of the nature of these polynomials, all right? They're not, exact except in the vicinity of our center here at one, all right? And the further we get, that we get from one, the worse and worse and worse our um, estimate gets, right? And not only that, the um, lower the polynomial is, so for example, P of zero uh, of X equals zero, that's not even close to natural log of X. X minus one is somewhat closer, especially in the vicinity of one, but still not close, right? Um, P2 of X is gonna get closer still. P3 of X will get even closer, okay? Because like you can see P2 of X, right, actually ends up going down towards negative infinity. But um, P3 of X at least is gonna start uh, increasing, right? If we went to P4 of X, we'd actually get a better approximation. P5 of X, better approximation. So as we increase, right, as the, nat um, the limit, as N goes to infinity, uh, P of N, right, we would like to see, or we would like to know whether or not that actually does in fact equal the natural log of x. So that's kind of a question mark, all right? But at least what we know is, is that if this series converges to the natural log of x, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get better and better approximations as we increase n, right? And as we get closer and closer and closer, in this case, to the center, okay? So that's kind of like one of the ways that we utilize these polynomials to kind of envision or imagine 
um, what we're doing here with Taylor series. And oftentimes what will happen is we'll be like working with computer programs, something along those lines, and we'll just increase that to a certain number of n where we're going to get a tiny little error. The difference between our actual function and our Taylor polynomial is extremely small, right? It's like, you know, within whatever error bound that we want. And at that point in time, we're like, okay, this is good enough. We're going to use this polynomial to approximate the natural log of x. So if we think about this as a big idea, okay, um, if we want to say if Pn is a Taylor polynomial for a function f of x, and there is, in fact, and we want to at least uh, state this for right now, there is a Taylor series that converges to f of x. That gives us the terms for Pn. As n goes to infinity, Pn will approximate f of x better and better. And every Taylor polynomial will approximate f of x the closer it is to a. So as we increase our n, as we get more and more terms inside of the Taylor series inside of our Taylor polynomial, we get a better approximation. Okay? And in addition to that, the closer that we are to a, the better our approximation actually gets. The farther off we are, the less confidence that we can have inside of our Taylor polynomial as an approximation tool. So the natural outgrowth of that is, is then, well, how big is that error? Like, let's say, for example, I take a Taylor polynomial of a certain size right, say Pn, and what I do is I want to then figure out, you know, how much error um, am I going to get with that particular Taylor polynomial when I try and approximate our function f of x with it, okay? So what we are going to use then in order to figure that out is we're going to use Taylor's theorem with a remainder. So let's say, that let f be a function that can be differentiated n plus 1 times on an interval i containing the real number a. And then we're going to let P of n be the nth Taylor polynomial of f at a, and let rn of x equal f of x minus pn of x, right? So basically what we're saying right here is, is we're going to have this remainder, right? That's my error, okay? That's the amount left over. That's the difference between the function and my Taylor polynomial, okay? Um, and so that's going to be the nth remainder. And then for each x in the interval i, there exists a real number c between a and x such that rn of x equals the n plus 1 derivative uh, of c at c over n plus 1 factorial times x minus 1 to the n plus 1. And then, so if there exists a real number that bounds that derivative, right, that makes f of n plus 1 of x the absolute value of it less than or equal to this m for all x belonging to i, whatever interval that you're on, then the absolute value of the remainder has got to be less than this equation right here. That's m divided by n plus 1 factorial over x minus a to the n plus 1. Okay, so basically what this is doing, this is bounding our error. It is saying my remainder, my leftover remainder has got to be less than whatever this value is. Okay, that's going to be the absolute back, uh, maximum for uh, my error. And so that's the bounding of my error there. All right, and so when we ask for, when somebody's like, hey, well, what's the error if you utilize a Taylor series to, or a Taylor polynomial to approximate a certain value, what they're asking for is they're asking for whatever this remainder actually is. That's what they're looking for, okay? And that's how we talk about it as mathematicians. So let's take a look at an example. Let's consider f of x equals the cube root of x. And we're gonna use p2 at x equals eight to approximate the cube root of 11 and then find the error. Now, one of the reasons why we're going to use at x equals 8 is because we know that at x equals 8, so f of 8 
is going to equal 8 cube root and that's equal to 2 which is actually pretty close to the cube root of 11. Okay, you can go in and approximate it and you actually see that it's actually pretty close to the cube root of 11. So we're gonna use x equals eight, like we're gonna set our eight because it's close to 11. Uh, well, it's close to the cube root of 11. The cube root of eight is close to the cube root of 11. All right, and so that's gonna be actually an important point when we're going out and doing approximations. Right? We wanna make sure that whatever our y value is, whatever we're centering at, has a y value close to whatever it is that we're trying to approximate, all right? Now, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go out and calculate P2, okay? So we wanna calculate P2. So um, we'll start out. We have uh, f of x is equal to, and we'll make that x to the one-third, and then f prime of x is gonna equal one-third x to the negative two-thirds, and then f double prime of x is going to equal um, negative two ninths x to the negative five thirds. Since we're taking the Taylor polynomial, let's put that into our, our Taylor polynomial. So um, our approximation p2 is going to then equal, um, first we're going to have, uh, we'll find it's going to be eight to the one third plus um, one third times eight to the negative two thirds times x minus eight plus, and then negative two ninths times one half eight to the negative five thirds times x minus eight squared. And that's our Taylor polynomial. Retranslated, this gives me 2 plus 1 twelfth times x minus 8 plus, or rather minus, uh, 1 out of 288 times x minus 8 squared. Okay, and that's P2. So what we're going to do then is we'll then just plug in 11, right? Because our x here is 11, okay? x equals 11. And so now P2 of 11 is going to end up equaling 2 plus 1 twelfth times 3 plus negative 1 over 288 times 3 squared. And that'll end up giving me approximately, or actually it will equal exactly, 2.21875. And that's my approximation. So there's the approximation. So in order to find that approximation, what I did was I went out and I found the Taylor polynomial that I was looking for, P2. Okay, centered at whatever center it is that I wanted, what, whatever the approximation, approximate point that I thought was good. In this case, eight, okay, which was close to the cube root of 11. And then once I found that Taylor polynomial, I just plugged in the value for x in this case, and that gave me my approximation. Now I need to go out and find my remainder or my error. So for my error, I'm gonna have Rn of x, my remainder, okay, is going to be less than or equal to m over n plus one factorial times the absolute value of x minus a to the n plus one. And we're gonna have that m is such that it will be the n plus one derivative at x is gonna be less than or equal to m, right, for all x belonging to i. So what that means is that I'm gonna to have to go find, in our case, we, we had P2, right? So we need F triple prime of X, okay? We're gonna to need to find that F triple prime of X and we're gonna to need to bound it from A to 11, okay? We don't know what our C is in this case, but that's okay. It's all right, all we need to do is create a boundary for it and I'll show you how to find that boundary in just a second. So F triple prime, well, what we had before, if we come up here and look, we had f double prime was negative two ninths x to the negative five thirds. So f double prime of x equals negative two ninths x to the negative five thirds. So f triple prime of x is gonna equal 10 over 27 x to the negative eight over three, or negative eight thirds. 
Now I need a boundary. And my bounds are going to be between, um, I want to figure out like what is the value for n? Or m, excuse me. What is the value for m? Okay? And so my interval, x belongs to i, is actually going to be in the vicinity of 8. Right? So we're going to be in the vicinity of 8. So we're going to be from 8 to 11 right, is going to equal i. So we're going to look for what's the biggest value, okay, um, that we could possibly have for i. Now, the biggest value that's going to be there is going to be when x equals 8 because this function right here, that's decreasing, right? It's going to get, keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's, it's, um, its derivative is negative, right, okay? So it just keeps getting smaller and smaller as we increase x. So m all right, is going to necessarily be, um, is gonna, we're gonna let m equal 10 over 27, eight to the negative eight thirds, because that is the largest value in absolute value, okay? For f triple prime of x in our interval i, or i equal eight to 11. So when I find that, what m is going to end up equaling, m equals 0 0.0014468. It's actually an approximation. That's approximation. Okay. And so we'll just keep this because it's actually somewhat larger than the m that we get. And so that's now our m. So our remainder, okay, our r2 of x, that in absolute value is going to end up being less than or equal to this 0 0.0014468. And then we'll divide it then through by um, three factorial, okay, times 11 minus eight cubed, right? Okay, because let's just look at our equation, right? We're looking for r2, the second, uh, the second, um, the remainder for the second poly Taylor polynomial. We have our m. We're going to divide by n plus one factorial, so that's three factorial times 11 minus eight. Right, x minus our a, our center, cubed. And so this is approximately 0 0.0065104. And that is our approximate error, okay? And so what we know is, is we know that the cube root of 11 is gonna equal, or is approximately equal to, in fact, it's less than or equal to We'll have our 2.21875 plus our error. And that is our approximation. Okay? So it's bounded. This is our approximation. This is, we could actually, we'll write it as plus or minus. So we'll let this approximately equal to 2.21875 plus or minus this. Um, this error bounds, all right? And that's how we find the error. So let's kind of take a look back at how we're gonna go out and find that error. So what we did was we first uh, calculated the Taylor polynomial we're using our equations for the Taylor polynomial, all right? And we were approximating in an area around that's close to the value of y that we're looking for. So in, that, in our case, um, the cube root of eight is actually pretty close to the cube root of 11. So that's the uh, center for our Taylor polynomial here. So we found our Taylor polynomial and then we used that, when we plugged in 11, that ended up being our approximation, this 2.21875, that's the approximation. Then to find our error, what we needed to do was we needed to utilize this formula for that remainder. That remainder ends up being our error, okay? The hardest part here is actually finding m. But all we really need to think about is we need to think about what is the bounding for m on whatever um, whatever interval that we're looking at? This one's fairly easy because you know the value is is constantly decreasing for x, and so consequently the highest value that we're going to have for the third derivative is going to be f triple prime of eight. Okay, right, and then we're just going to go plug in m, 
at that value right, into our equation. So here's our equation right here. We plug that in and that gives us our error bounds. And so the uh, cube root of 11 is gonna be approximately equal to 2.21875 plus or minus this error bound right here, okay? Now, there's a lot to get about Taylor uh, series and McLaren series and hopefully this gives you some um, background from which to work to work on Taylor and McLaren series. I would tell you that there's no better way to go in than to go into a textbook or into a set of notes or maybe a nice set of online notes um, or even to take a look at your notes here and kind of work through, not only work through problems, but also to read and really understand um, these theorems. It's very theoretical, okay? It's not really connected to stuff that we see in the real world when we say like in the real world, even though it has incredible real world applications, it's not the kind of thing that you're gonna see, you're not gonna walk around and go, oh, there's a Taylor series. That's not gonna happen. Oh, there's a McLaren series. That's not gonna happen, okay? So what we really need to do, I think, is to dive in and to dive into the theorems, to dive into the concepts and the definitions to help you really grasp what it means to work with Taylor series and McLaren series.